yesterday. So to end it today in church with all you great people, it's just overwhelming. So for those who don't know me, shame on you. <laughs> My name is Chris and I'm here to welcome you. And uh, I just want to challenge you a little bit this morning. It's not homework because God's work can't be homework. But I just ask to open your hearts to listen to the message this morning. And then this evening or something at the dinner table, share with your family what the message is meant to you or what it spoke to you. So if you want to greet your neighbors, we'll continue. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king darkness flee I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah fear you lost your hold on me Feed. 
Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemy. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder In the presence of my enemies Sing a little louder Oh, louder than the unbelief Sing a little louder My weapon is the melody Sing a little louder Heaven comes to fight for me Sing a little louder In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. You're gonna come into this place. Come down into this place. Fill this room with your presence, Lord. And I pray that we can worship you with all of our hearts this morning.
this morning. Father, your beauty is overwhelming. Your glory surrounds us this morning. Father, we praise you. We praise you for for everything you've done for us, for your faithfulness, for your willing to forgive us in our shame. Father, for adopting us into your family, for inviting us into your eternal family. Father, we're so grateful for that and for this chance that we have to live here on earth as your ambassadors, to love others. Father, we praise you. We love you, Father. And we sing this morning of your beauty and of your power and your sacrifice for us, Lord. We love you. I see your face in every song.
we're going to praise you this morning for your beauty, for your majesty, for ruling over our lives, for ruling over this earth. Lord, we thank you for eternity and the hope we have in that. Father, it fills us with joy. We're so excited to meet you face to face, Father, to see your beauty face to face. Ecclesiastes 3 says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. Father, we praise you for your sovereignty. We can't even fathom your beauty your everlasting beauty. Father, we love you. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name. I invite you to be seated. And I feel like we just need to reflect on these words and reflect on the sermon that we've been going through, the series we've been going through. And this morning, as you prepare your heart to hear God's word, invite you to open up your heart to him, surrender to him, leave your burdens behind, leave them at the foot of the cross, come this morning expecting to hear him speak into your heart, expecting him to move in your heart, let's take some time to do that this morning. look forward to the day when we will arrive on eternity's shore, where death will just be a memory, if that, and tears no more. God, when we will be face to face with you forever, reigning with you, living with you, experiencing intimacy with you, as you have in the Trinity forever, we will be like you, we will be with you. Lord, we long for home. We long for our eternal destiny where we actually belong because we don't belong here. We weren't created for pain. We weren't created for suffering. We were created to live whole. We were created to live in the fullness of all of your goodness. But Lord, we don't deserve, we don't deserve to walk in your goodness when we have made such a mess we have brought the pain, we have brought the sin. But in your great love, you made a way for us through Jesus that we could again be restored, that we could be restored to that heavenly reality of intimacy and life and fullness with God forever and ever. Lord, we have, we have too many reasons to praise you. We, we don't have enough time in eternity to sing of your greatness. But Lord, can we at least try for now while we are here? Lord, there will be a day when we reach eternity's shore, but until then we are here. 
And until then, we still have the same opportunity because you've made it possible even here that we can live in intimacy with you, that we can live in your joy and have life abundantly as we surrender to your Holy Spirit, as we fellowship with you, as we fellowship with your body, as we surrender our desires and our wants and we live in your kingdom for your purposes. Lord, we ask that you would come and fellowship with us today, that today would be a day when we experience eternity sure in our hearts, in our souls, that we would live in intimacy with you. Lord, for the joy that is set before us, give us the courage to face today. We invite you, we invite you to lead us. You are our shepherd, you are What a cool God we have. Oh, man. Good morning, Timberline. My name is Benji. I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm very grateful to be here in God's presence with you. God is good. Amen. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. And I would invite you. We've been singing songs. I love to sing. I love to worship through singing. We're not going to stop worshiping. We're just going to do some different tasks or different um, activities to continue worshiping. So let's maintain our hearts of worship before the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Lord, you've given us much. And so we give cheerfully from that to this tithe and offering this morning. And we pray that you would take this and use it for your kingdom, that you would use it for eternal purposes, that you would multiply it. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would expand that your will would be done, and may this money be used for those purposes and those alone. May you be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go ahead. A couple things to keep in mind schedule-wise coming up in the next few weeks. One is we're working at filling a pictorial directory. So what that means is we want a picture of you if you call Timberline your church. Now I confess to you, I have not yet emailed my picture to Michelle and Jackie. So what I'm doing this morning is I'm writing a mental note, which means a reminder in my phone that says on Wednesday, send them the picture that they want. So I would encourage you this morning Make a mental plan and write it down and tell your friend or your spouse, this is how I'm going to get the picture to Michelle and Jackie, or this is when I'm going to sign up. Because when I, once upon a time, I was new to Timberline, and I didn't know anyone. And it took us about a year for Marlon and I to actually, for Marlon to impart to me who everyone was. And it would just be so convenient if we had a directory with your picture in it, because I like to look at your smiling faces, not only on Sunday mornings from up here, but also in a book. So please keep that in mind and think of how you're going to get your picture. Michelle, can you raise your hand? You're back there. Jackie's back on that side. Those are the two people. Um, When is the next picture-taking day? Uh, Today. 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 So just smiled this morning, and you can have your picture taken right out there in the lobby. That's great. All right. Um, Also, coming up on May 8th is our next Kids Night In. Two important changes to that. As our kids grow, we're growing the age. So Kids Night In is now through first grade. Um, So anybody infant to first grade is welcome to come. The time has also changed. It's going to be from 4 to 7 instead of 5 to 8. Not that different, but 4 to 7. One thing that I would encourage you to think about, we are still looking for some volunteers for this night in particular, and we would love to have your help. We have a lot of kids. They love to learn about Jesus. They love to dance and sing. They love to interact with each other. They just need some supervision. So if you have any desire to work with children, um, I would really encourage you to talk to Bethany. Bethany, can you raise your hand? And um, we would love to have you there. I'm going to be at this next one. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think you should be there too. Um, Also, coming up in June, on June 4th through 6th, is going to be the Timberline Camping Weekend at Locust Lake State Park, which is somewhere up 81 towards Hazleton-ish. And um, again, Marvin and Bethany are the ones in charge of that. So if you would like to be a part of that or you have any questions about that, you can talk to Marvin and Bethany. Their contact information is in the directory. And on May the 2nd, now this is getting sooner, May the 2nd, which is next week, is the deadline to sign up for the men's boot camp retreat. The retreat itself is on May 14th through 16th, but we need to know if you're coming and we need your money. 
by next week. So that's, that's $100. And um, again, this is one of my favorite, most meaningful weekends of Timberline Fellowship as a man, fellowshipping with other men. So I'd really encourage you, if you're a, um, a woman who knows a man, tell him to come. And if you're a man, come. It's going to be really, it's going to be a really powerful weekend. Keith Sensnick's going to be our speaker, but we need to know by next week if you're coming. And while AJ's coming up, he's going to talk about the young adults. Um, just a shout out, a reminder to you all, we do have a youth group. I just spent all day with the youth boys, and man, am I sore. And if you don't see youth girls around, it's because the girls are having an event today, like last night into today. So we have a youth group that meets every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. If you know any youth in the area who would like to be a part of it, have them contact me, or they can just show up at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights here at the church. But AJ's talking about a different group of people. So speaking of youth, um, if you're an adult and more on the youthful side, um, if you are a young adult, uh, I wanted to encourage you to come out to our group that we're starting up uh, coming up May 5th. It's a Wednesday night. Uh, we are going to be at the McDowell's. If you are interested, we are going to be having a fellowship night. So lots of food, yard games, yada, yada, yada. Just a really cool time to hang out. Um, please contact Krista McDowell. Her number is in the directory. Um, the following week, we are going to be doing a night of teaching at my place. Um, starting at 6.30. It's going to be May 12th. Yes, I can do math. Um, so if you're interested in joining this group or just interested in coming, please uh, just let somebody know, and we want to have you. So thanks. Thanks, AJ. Now Marlon's going to talk about something that he's really excited about. So I asked um, a guy by the name of Peyton Keener, why do you want to become a partner at Timberline? And he said, so I can serve others. And then he told me a story that explains the value of partnership, and I want to share that with you this morning. So Peyton has a, a friend named Max who is visiting from the Ukraine. And Max said to Peyton, I sense you really need to become uh, part of a church so you can get connected and get committed and learn to grow in your Christian life. And, and this guy named Max said to Peyton, I want you to really think about this. When I look at you, I just sense you're not really part of a community of believers. And at that time, Peyton was just kind of jumping around from church to church. At first, all this kind of went right over Peyton's head. And then one day, another friend said, Peyton, take a step of faith. You know, there may be things that God is withholding from you. I thought this was interesting. There might be things that God is withholding you from until you take a step of faith and join a church. And so today, both Peyton and Sue Wood are taking steps of faith by becoming partners here at Timberline, and they're committed to protecting the unity of Timberline, sharing the responsibilities of Timberline, serving the ministry of Timberline, and supporting the testimony of Timberline. So I'd like to invite Peyton and Sue to come up at this time if they would. So you can just come right up here, Peyton right over here on the other side of Benji. And Benji's going to introduce them to you. So this is the man that Marlon's been talking about just now. What a guy, what a guy. So this is Peyton Keener. He lives in Ronx. He's an auto technician at Souders Motors in, um, in, right here in Strasburg. He really enjoys spending time with friends. He likes to hunt, he likes to hike, and he likes to ride four-wheelers. And over here we have Sue Wood. Now, Sue comes from Holtwood, which is much farther away, but that's okay. But Sue is one of those people who went to Bart Mennonite Church way back in the day. And when Bart planted other churches, went along with one of the church plants and was faithful there, and then has recently come back to Timberline. So Sue, in a way, is just coming home again. But, you know, in a really, I was glad to see you, that you participated in the church that you were a part of for that time. Now I'm glad to see you back. Sue comes, like I said, from Holtwood. She's retired from the Presbyterian home, but she also enjoys working at BB's in her retirement. She enjoys word puzzles, but she really just loves talking to people and talking about Jesus with people, which is really cool. I just wanted to make a comment. She didn't retire from the retirement home, but she retired from working at the retirement home, right? Just wanted to, I'm just wondering how old you can be to retire from the retirement home. But anyway, that, that was well done. So anyway, these folks have committed themselves to partnership, and I would encourage you to talk with them this morning afterwards, particularly if you're a partner, introduce yourself if you don't know them, uh, or even if you do know them, just welcome them here. They're going to hang around here for the service. So would you please give them a warm Timberline welcome? Welcome, Peyton and Sue. You guys can be seated. So I'd like to invite the uh, ushers to come up for the bucket offering, if you would. Come up at this time. And you guys can go ahead. So we're in the process of having some conversation with, by the way, this is our offering for extreme poverty, and I want to thank you in advance for your generous donation. We're in conversation right now with the core team of people that have gone down to the village in Guatemala that we support this offering is for. 
We're having conversation with them, also with Claudia, about the next step and what we're going to do concerning our relationship with our village. And so um, I'm really grateful that we have an opportunity to support our village. And this offering, this second offering that we take is for that. We've chosen to do some sacrificing so that other people can just eat and can just live. So, so I'd like to invite uh, Butch Marvin to come up at this time, if he would. I want to tell you just a little bit about Butch. In 1989, I was in um, Belize. Whoa. I don't know. Me or you, one of the two. But in 1989, I was in Belize, Central America, on a missions trip down there. And a friend of mine named Evan Yoder, who was back at the home church, said, hey, we got to know this guy named Butch. And um, we shared the gospel for him. Pray that he come to know the Lord. And this is what Evan said. He looks like one of those guys that has a Doberman and a Harley in the backyard. So I don't know if Butch looks like that this morning or not, but anyway. No dogs. No dogs. No dogs. No dogs. So anyway, um, we prayed for Butch, and, and Butch gave his heart to the Lord Jesus. And I just want to tell you this morning, Butch has just been a real friend to me over the years, and he's been a friend of Timberline's. And we're just delighted that he is going to be able to share with us this morning. He's going to fit right into this purpose-driven life stuff because he's gone through this a number of times in preaching himself. And so we're just delighted to have Butch share with us today. So I'd like to invite you just to join with me in prayer as you bow your heads. Father, just pray today for Butch. I pray that you go before him. I pray that you just speak truth into his life. And I pray that you open our hearts to hear what you have for us today. Father, we're so grateful that you brought Butch here. We're just so grateful that Butch has come to love the Lord Jesus with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. We pray and we thank you in the present in the precious name of Jesus, amen. God bless you, Butch. Thanks. How y'all doing this morning? Good. It's good to be here with you. I'm excited for the opportunity to share with you on this message, and if I can figure out how to get my computer working here. Interesting. There we go. Sorry about that. So I wanted to talk to you this morning about this thought in in week six, which is how I see my life, shapes my life. And and I want to talk to you a little bit about my life because this statement is uh, something that really, really hits home for me and I think is really, really important. So some of you know me. Some of you know my story. Some of you don't. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story and and tied into this whole idea of this, how I see my life, shapes my life. So you know, I grew up in southwest Philadelphia in a broken home, you know, a lot of mess, a lot of weird stuff, not the best home. You know, we didn't have money, we didn't have food, we just didn't have a lot of things. And, and I grew up looking at life from the perspective of, as, as an adult, my goal would be to just make money, provide for my family. You know, you get up, you get married, you have kids. You know, I don't know why all that stuff is what I thought, but that's how I saw my life. So that's what shaped my life. And that was my goal. My goal was to do that. And um, I grew up in a loud place. People that know me think I'm loud. Um, they should meet my family. I'm really the quietest one. And, and it's funny because it's loud because you had to be loud to get people's attention. You, you know that, so I thought that's what you did because that's how I saw my life. That's what shaped my life. And that's kind of the whole thought about this thing. And so I grew up at 17. I met my first wife, Mary. Um, she was a babe. She was awesome. And, you know, you just dated because that's what you did, right? Because that's what everybody else did. That's what you saw. That's what you did. And we had children, and, and we you know, just kind of did what we did. We worked hard. I always worked two or three jobs, always did a lot of side jobs because, you know, how I saw my life is you need money to make life work. We didn't have money growing up, so I thought you need to have money. My dad, he didn't work. He was a bum. And so I didn't really know much other than you, I didn't want to be like that, so that's how I saw things. So that's what shaped what I did, and that was my whole focus. And my focus was just to make money and try to do things. I was loud, obnoxious, arrogant, aggressive. Um, none of you are allowed to say that about me, by the way. <laughs> I can say that about me. But that's, that's what I saw. That's what shaped me. How you see your life shapes your life. Marlon talked a little bit about 1989. This couple knocked on the door. They actually knocked on our door in September. 
1988. We moved in in June of 1988, and they wanted to share the gospel with us, and they had this apple pie, and so we took the pie and heard them on their way. And, you know, the pie was great, you know, and, and I do remember years later Evan's wife saying, I was so terrified because I was sure you had a Harley, a Doverman tied to your Harley. I don't like dogs. I got nothing against dogs. I just don't want dogs. I did have a Harley for a while. You know, I don't think I look like a Harley kind of guy. Maybe I did back then. I'm not really sure. I have a brother now. My next younger brother is a Harley guy. And you would know him. He's a Harley guy because he's a big, burly guy with lots of hair. Well, not on the top, but lots of hair on the sides and tattoos. He actually has a tattoo that goes from right here to right here. It's of a bucking bronco. It's blood red. He got that tattoo because how he saw life shaped his life. How he saw life was he was a guy that wanted to have a new Harley. He didn't have enough money. And there was a contest by a brewing company out in Montana. Whoever got the biggest tattoo would win. He won the Harley. You know, he won the Harley. He has, I think it's 55 inches or something, this tattoo. I think his second place guy was 48. My sister sends me an email 20 years ago and says, Kenny's on the Internet. He's tattooed from the top of his neck. To, but that's how he saw his life. That's what shaped his life. That's how I saw his life. This couple knocked on the door. We had a 13-year-old son at the time, and he was starting to make bad decisions. My first wife and I grew up in bad environments, lots of drugs, lots of alcohol, lots of abuse, lots of addictions. Neither one of us chose those paths. I don't know why. I look back today and say maybe I do know why. Back then I didn't know why. And so we moved that. We, you know, we didn't do that, but our youngest son was starting to choose some of those paths. They weren't looking too good. Didn't know what to do with him. Tried everything. You know, I remember one time. This is, I'm not proud of this, but this is a true statement. He, I was so irritated because of what he did. I snatched him up and I had him up against the wall like this by his throat. And I looked at him and thought to myself, what the world's going on here? Because that's how my life was shaped. You know, when I didn't do something right, my dad would just punch me. Broke my jaw two times when I was growing up. When my sisters would do something wrong, my dad would punch me because he didn't believe it hitting girls. That's how he saw his life. That's what shaped his life. I remember doing that to Sean and thinking to myself, this is crazy. What's going on here? This guy I worked for at the time, he liked to share the gospel. It was a used car lot I worked at. It was kind of funny because he would share the gospel and tell me about this great God and how awesome he was. And so cars would come in, and he'd buy these cars, and we'd go all over them. I'd give him a list of stuff wrong with the car, and then he'd sell the car, and we'd only fix two or three to five or seven things that were wrong. And Then the person would come back because the other stuff was wrong with the car. And he'd be like, wow, I didn't know anything about that. I used to think, oh, I don't know about this God thing. You know, it doesn't sound too good. But the guy, something about him was stirring in me. Evan and Sandy knocked on our door. Oldest son making lots of bad decisions. One day, my, Mary and I were talking. That's my first wife's name. And I said, maybe we ought to get a hold of that couple that came and knocked on our door. And so we called them up. My wife tracked them down and called them up. And they came over. It was February. It was cold. Sandy never wore shoes. She didn't have any shoes on. They came in the house. I'm thinking, what's all this about? We just want to know where the church is, what time it meets. We were pretty confident it met on Sunday. And, and they're like, they sit down in the living room, and they get this track out, and they show us this big chasm, and they put this, you know, this Billy Graham track where you've got to cross this chasm because you need Jesus and all this. And they're saying all this stuff, and I'm sitting there thinking, what's up with these people? Then they did the most bizarre thing. They said, hey, we're going to go stand on the sidewalk out front so you guys can think about how you want to respond to this invitation we just gave you. So they go out the door, shut the door behind them. I said to Mary, let's just turn the lights off, go to bed. <laughs> Sean's like, yeah, that's good. And Mary's like, we're not doing that. So we brought them back in and said, hey, guys, you know, that's nice. You know, that chasm, all that's nice. But we just want to know where your church is and what time it meets. And so we ended up going to church. In the, in the beginning of 1989, I think it was February, the first time we went to Bart Midnight Church. And through a series of events, a Bible study started, got saved, and really started to realize that how I saw life had shaped my life, and I hadn't seen the whole picture of life. So my dad made a lot of mistakes. He never saw the whole picture of life. He only saw part of it. Life goes on, and... <laughs> So how I see my life shapes my life. And so if you remember, the Bible offers three metaphors for life. Benji talked about two of them last week. Life is a test. Life is a trust. And life is also a temporary assignment. 
And going to church, I started to realize that because what was interesting, the two things that were most interesting about my first encounter with church was is I went there and I felt welcomed. And, you know, it was singing hymns and they were just coming out with overheads. So it was the, the Mennonites would call it singing off the wall because they actually shined it up on the wall, you know, and it was, it was kind of interesting, and there was a song leader, and I still don't get this, but the song leader, instead of what happened up here this morning, the song leader would up there and go like this. I'm thinking, why is he making J's? What's that all about? <laughs> By the way, if anybody knows why they do that, please tell me, because I'd really like to know. I guess I could Google it. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeting away. Life is a temporary assignment. In 2015, my first wife got diagnosed with cancer and had a surgery and 14 months of chemo and radiation. And she had 21 really good months of health. And then she got diagnosed with cancer a second time. And with three and a half months after that, she died. And life became a mess for me because she was like the rock in my life. But see, life is a temporary assignment. And through a series of events and the grace of God, I met a second wife. And now I have a second wife. And her name is Charmaine. Maybe she would stand up real quick so you could see her. She'll wave. <laughs> she told me she was going to sit next to the exit. I'm surprised she's not sitting right there in case I embarrassed her. Charmaine is, was also a widow. And, and she had a great deal. She had much more loss in her life than I had in my life. But, you know, when you lose things... This verse really stands out. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeting away. We, we think this is an amazing place, and, and it is. The world's an amazing place, but it's just for a time. It's just for a season. It's short. You know, the Bible is filled with all kinds of teachings on the briefness of life. I am here on earth for just a little while. For we were born... But yesterday, and know nothing, our days on earth are fleeting as shadows. Now, I was just telling somebody happy birthday this morning, because they had a birthday earlier, and I hadn't seen them, so I told them happy belated birthday. And I said, are you still 29? And she informed me that she's now 39. But you know what's interesting about that statement? And for you that are young, you won't get this. And you that are a little older will get this. That time between 29 and 39, when you were in it, it seemed like forever. And when it passed, you would look back, and it was like that big. It's like gone so quickly. It's amazing how much that changed. You were born, for you were born but yesterday, and know nothing. Our days on earth are fleeting as a shadow. Lord, help me to realize. This is a good verse. Help me to realize how brief my time on earth will be. Help me to know that I am here for but a moment more. You know, we never know how much time we have left. That became a bigger reality to, me and re reality to me in recent years. That really did. And then Psalm 119 in the New Living Translation, I showed to you earlier in, the, in the, today's English version, but I am only a foreigner in the land. Don't hide your commands from me. To make the most out of life, I need to realize that compared to eternity, this life is very short. And if we back up to this last verse... I'm only a foreigner in the land. You know, I did a number of mission trips. I've preached on several different continents. I've been around a couple different places around the world. And here's the part that's really weird. The best part of those trips was always when the plane wheels touched down in Philadelphia for me. That's, I'm just being honest. I didn't fit in in those other cultures. You know, one night in, in a village in Kenya, Africa, it was amazing. 154 people. I gave an altar call at the end of a message, and 154 people came forward to give their lives to Christ. But yet, the most important part of that trip is when those wheels touch down in America. That's weird. That's not the greatest thing. You're thinking about, what about all those souls? How awesome that must be. But see, I was still seeing life. I was having some more vision, some wider vision, but I was still seeing lives. I still had all those years of my life, how it was shaped from growing up. Today, I can honestly tell you that my home is in heaven. And this place here, it's nice. But it's short. It's temporary. And the only thing that matters is how many you can take with you to heaven. 
You know, they tell you you can't take nothing with you to heaven. That's just a lie. You can take people with you. You can't take your stuff. You know, I have a big toy box. When I was a kid, I didn't have a toy box. I have a big toy box. And my toy box is 50 by 42, and it's full. And I think it ought to be bigger. It was 30 by 50, and I thought, that's not big enough. I need to put a 12 by 50 addition on it. I'm thinking about building another toy box. It's going to be 60 by 100. And I'm going to build a little house and hook to it so I can live in it because my six-year-old grandson said to me, Pop up, you build over here. You should make it so you can walk right out the door of your house right into your shop. That's my toy box, right? Just to be honest, that's really what it is. It's just got all the junk in it, which is what this stuff is. It's a bunch of junk. As at this point in my life, I think, oh, I've got to wash another car. You know, I have a little car collection. I have some regular cars, and my wife, she lives in Westminster, and I live up here, so we commute back and forth, and we got cars down there and cars up here. I'm going to tell you something about having all them cars. One always needs washed. Actually, two or three always need washed. They always need gas. They always need inspected. They always need repaired. They always need maintained. And I used to think a lot about that stuff. But I'm only a foreigner in the land. <clears throat> I'm only a foreigner in this land. Don't hide from me. We've got to make the most of this life because compared to eternity, it's really, really short. So maybe I'll just set a little bit of a context for the message today. So if you're a believer... If you're here and you've made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, if you've said, Lord, forgive me, I want in, then you're in, then what I'm going to tell you should make a lot of sense. If you're not a believer, it might not make as much sense. But if you're a believer, you've already bought into the idea that life's a temporary assignment. You've already agreed with that statement. If you're not a believer, you may not agree with that yet. You may think that that when you die, as my cousin Lance always says, you become worm food. He thinks that's the end of it. It's not. To make the most out of life, I need to realize that compared with eternity, this life, this time right here is very, very short. I'm 63 years old. It's very, very short. I don't know how long I'll live, 70, I don't know. I don't know how long I'll live. But even if I live to be 100, how much is that compared to eternity? We also need to realize that the earth is only our temporary residence And as was covered on day four, it's only a staging area for eternity. It's only a staging area. It's just getting ready. It's kind of like the staging area. It's kind of interesting to me. You know, I I have very plain and simple taste. And and my wife, she's got pretty taste. The stuff she likes, it's pretty. She tells me, that's not pretty. And I look at it and go, you know, it's really not. (laughs) And then she'll she'll say, that's pretty. I'll say, oh, yeah, it is. So she wants to redecorate our house. And I'm like, well, there ain't nothing wrong with that. Why would you get rid of that? And she's like, because it's not pretty. And I think, she's right. But I'm thinking, it looked all right. What's interesting is this is just a staging area. You want to sell your house, you're not living there, you hire a company, come in, they stage furniture in it. They make it look just perfect. They just make it look perfect. Did you ever go look at a house? You've looked at it online and seen all these photographs of it. And then you get to the house and go, I, I didn't, that's smaller than I thought it was. That's, see, they staged it just right. This is just a staging area. This is just a short little time. It's important that we live with a view of eternity, realizing that we are only ambassadors here on earth. It's really important that we do that. It's really important that we do that. I'm only a temporary resident, and as a Christian, my real homeland is heaven. And it really is. You know, one of the things that's interesting is I do a lot of funerals. I did a lot of funerals. I only ever married two couples. I don't know what that has to say for my... Uh, actually, I recently might have married a third couple. i got to rethink that. But I did, I'm telling you, I did hundreds of funerals. I stopped counting when I was over 200. It was just too many. And what's interesting at a lot of funerals is people want to talk about how I want to go... I can't wait to get there to see Aunt Bessie. Can't get there to wait to see so and so. And you rarely hear people say, I can hardly wait until I see Jesus. Now, when Mary first died, I was really looking forward to seeing her in heaven. You know what I'm really looking forward to today? I'm really looking forward to standing in the presence of God, worshiping Him. Mary will be there, that'll be cool. Lots of other great people that went before. The, the gal that led Mary and I to the Lord, Sandy Yoder, she died in 1996. She'll be there. That'll be great. The lady that led Mary to the Lord it was uh, Sadie Yoder, her mother-in-law. She'll be there. That'll be great. 
But nothing will compare with standing in the presence of God. Nothing. That's what we need to long for. That's what we need to remember. When I think about life becoming a temporary assignment, there's a question that pops into my mind. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Why am I here? What's my purpose? That question pops to my mind. And there's two answers that come, that come into my mind right away. One of them is the Great Commission from Matthew 28, which starts in verse 16. It says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came and to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So, so this is like... This is right before Jesus ascends into heaven. This is after he's died, after he's been resurrected. This is right before. This is our marching orders. If you're a believer, this is what we're supposed to do. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When I think about life being a temporary assignment, I think, wow. What's, what's that mean? What am I supposed to do? I need to make the most of this life I have. Whether I have two years, ten years, two months, two days, whatever I have left, am I making the most of it? And then the second thought that comes to my mind is this. John 10.10 10 talks about the full, the abundant, the satisfying life. In John 10.10, 10, the NIV says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And the, NI, or the New Living Translation says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. A rich and satisfying Jesus, his whole purpose is that we would have a good life here and an amazing eternity. That we would have a good life here, the best we can, and an amazing eternity. But most of us, we focus on here. We focus on what's happening here. I do this more than anybody. I am guilty of this, as guilty as anybody. The, the King James Version talks about an abundant life. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. So, so Jesus' whole deal, right? Remember when he was asked a question, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Really boils down to this, go out and make disciples. Go out and tell people about Jesus. And I'm not sure you just need to go, hi, what's your name? Dax. Hi, Dax. Do you know Jesus? Yes. Let me tell you about Jesus, <laughs> right? I don't know that you're supposed to do it that way. I think the way you're supposed to do it is you're supposed to come over and you're supposed to move the coffee first so you don't spill it. <laughs> and then you just say, hi, what's your name? Hi, Sue. Oh, nice to meet Hello. you, Sue. My name's Butch. What's your name? Tana. Hi, Tana. Nice Tana. to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. And just become friends. Just love on Sue and love on Tana and just become their friend and get to know them. And just spend some time with them. Get to learn what, what their story is and what they're going through. And then just let Jesus kind of spill out of you because you're loving Jesus. Because you're loving them. That's what we're supposed to do. And by the way, if you do those things, that's what you get. You get an abundant life. You get a fully satisfied life. I think that's what it says there. You get them a rich and satisfying life. My translation is this. The devil comes to take all you got. But Jesus came so that you can have a fully satisfied life time here. I feel bad for this poor girl on the camera. I just realized that she's trying to follow me around. <laughs> I should probably behave. There are two truths that all believers should never forget. There are two things all believers compared with eternity. Life is here is very short. These are facts. See, if you know Jesus, your home is in heaven. If you don't know Jesus, you still have an eternity. Everyone's born with eternity. It's not so nice, the other choice. It's not so nice. Lord, help me to realize how brief my time on earth will be. Help me to know that I'm here for but a moment more. I'm thinking about that verse when I say some of the dumb things that I say. I think, uh, you know, if I was thinking about Jesus and I was thinking about eternity, I probably wouldn't have said that. Probably that wouldn't have bothered me that much. I like, to, I like tow trucks. I used to have tow trucks. I like tow trucks. I watch these two tow shows from up in Canada where they go out and tow this stuff around. I really like the equipment. I like thinking about how to recover them. I'm constantly telling my wife how I would rig that thing to turn it over and stuff like that. So I was watching this tow show, and this guy has a $729,000 tow truck, and it, got the, it slid and hit one of his other trucks, and it put this little dent, I mean a little dent, 
in the back of this tow truck, 729,000. And he was all worked up about this. And I said, oh, come on, man, put your big boy pants on, just go to work. And then I looked over at Charmaine and said, I'd have been just like that 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I'd have been all worked up about that dent. It's just a dent. It's just a dent. And somebody's going to dent it, so they did. Help me to realize, help me to realize how short this time is. And earth is only my temporary home. So if you call God your father, live your time as a temporary resident on earth in fear, which means respect. He is the God who judges all people by what they have done. And he doesn't play favorites. So if you call God your father, if you call yourself a believer, live your life knowing that your time here is brief, knowing that there's a purpose, and knowing that you can take others to heaven. When I met Charmaine, she had a lot of loss in her life. She really did. And I thought, I wonder if I could be a person that might bring her some smiles. I wonder if I could be someone that could show her some joy here. She loved the Lord. Her home's in heaven. She knows where she's going. She's got that. And my goal is to try to bring her some smiles. I don't do real good at that sometimes. You know, when you're trying to merge two lives and she's not stubborn at all, I am really stubborn. It's, you know, but I'm working on that. Pray for us. Pray for her. So I have a question for you to consider today. It's just a question out of the book, and it's really simple. Should the fact that life on earth is just a temporary assignment influence the way I'm living right now? Should it influence the way I'm living right now? I mean, that's really the question. That's the question you need to ask yourself. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as a temporary resident. Are we doing that? Are we living for Christ? Are we leaning in? Are we doing the things that he wants us to do? That's really the question. So how we live matters, and it matters a lot. And I love this next set of verses, Philippians 3, 19 and 20. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think about this life here on earth. But, as, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. I'm not sure how much people realize this is really the Bible Belt. This really is like a Bible Belt here where we live. This is kind of an amazing place. Charmaine just lives 70 miles away. And there's our next-door neighbors there are devout Christians. But people are not as friendly. People are not as outgoing. Nobody talks to me about Jesus except our neighbors. Nobody does anything that you would even think there's any sign of Christianity. That's just 70 miles from here. You know, I grew up in southwest Philly. And I still have a lot of family there, 40 to 45, 50 miles from here. And it's just, it's not like it is. I have a new neighbor in our neighborhood, and he comes up the other day and says hello. And, it, you know, we were like, you know, a good, you know, 75, 80 seconds in before one of us brought Jesus up. You know, it just, it's a little different. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. And they think only about this life here on earth. But we have this amazing future. We have this amazing opportunity. We have this amazing opportunity. So we are Christian ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. That's you and me. Through us, he's making his appeal. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. When we pray for, when we love on, and we reach out to people. You're cheating on God if you want your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get. You end up enemies of God and his ways. You're cheating on God if you just want it your way. Have you ever thought about that? Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourself cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. See, it don't have to be pretty, right? But it's nice if it's pretty. You know, it can be a little cozy. It can be a little bit that way. Perhaps the highlight of this chapter is the following statement. In God's eyes, the greatest heroes of faith are those who achieved prosperity and success and power in this life. It's not those, but those who treat this life as a temporary assignment and serve faithfully, expecting their promised reward in heaven. 
Hebrews 11, 13 through 16 talks about that. And, you know, the verses preceding that, the first couple of verses talk about faith, what real faith is, and then it gives some examples, you know, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Sarah. It gives these examples of people who lived out what they were supposed to. And here's what it says as the follow-up to that. All these great people died in faith. When I, when I think of that great list of people in that thing, you know, Steve and Sadie Yoder would be on that list, you know. My wife Mary would be on that list. Sandy Yoder would be on that list if the Bible were written today. All these great people died in faith. They did not get the things that God promised his people, but they saw them coming. Do you see it? Do you realize what this eternity has for us? Do you realize this amazing reward that awaits us? Do you know if you have old cars, they don't rust in heaven? There's no rust and moth to destroy anything. But they saw them coming far in the future and were glad. They said they were like visitors and strangers on earth. I used to really be comfortable in America. And I'm really uncomfortable in America today. I used to say, I bleed red, bleed blue if you cut me. I'm really uncomfortable in America today. They were like visitors and strangers on earth. When people saw such things, they showed they are looking for a country that, is, that will be their own. If they had been thinking about the country they had left, they could have gone back. But they were waiting for a better country, a heavenly country. So God is not ashamed to be called their God but he has prepared a city for them. So here's the memory verse this week, right? So I'm going to say it. I want you guys to say it back to me, okay? You guys ready? So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I want you to know when my wife died, my first wife died, that was the most devastating thing that's ever happened to me. And I, I'm not over it yet. I just, I, during the day goes by, they don't think about her, they don't cry about her. I'm so blessed to have an amazing new wife who makes me smile and cares about me and loves me. I'm excited to have that. But right here, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. So as soon as I think about something that makes me think about Mary, I, I say two things right away. I'll say I'm out loud if I'm by myself. If I'm in a crowd of people, I'll just say I'm to myself quietly in my head. Thank you, Lord, for saving Mary. And thank you, Lord, that she's home in heaven, enjoying the amazing life that will just last forever and ever and ever. Guys, what matters? This is what matters. This world is not our home. This time is not our home. A verse to remember, so we fix our eyes on not what, only, what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what unseen is eternal. And the thought I want you to ponder is, shouldn't the fact, shouldn't, not should, shouldn't the fact that life on earth is just a temporary assignment influence and change the way I'm living right now? So the worship team is going to come, and they're going to, they're going to lead a song that, it was very meaningful to me, and it talks about home. It talks about our home. And I just want to tell you briefly why it's so meaningful to me. So in August of 2018, Mary started having some pain. And in September, the pain was moved to another area, so she had this pain in both places. And October 4th, we went to see her uh, cancer surgeon. And for her, it was a, her second or six-month checkup that year. And he told us the bad news. He said her numbers were off the charts and stuff, and they, they needed to do an ultrasound. And over the next couple of days, they did a whole bunch of stuff. And on October 12th, we got to see her oncologist. And her oncologist said, Mary, this is one we need God's help on because medical science can't heal you. And we were driving home that day from the cancer center, and Mary said, I know you want to have a service for me when I die. She never wanted a service. She said, if, if you have one that's really upbeat, you can have one. And she said, I just love this song by Chris Tomlin. So I used to hate this song. 
And so this is a song I'd like you guys to listen to. I'd like you guys to pay attention to the words. So if you guys want to go ahead. I just want to encourage you to really think a lot about what that says. And I just want to ask you a question. And so crossing the line of faith is a really simple thing to do. In your heart, you need to decide that you need to change. You need to say you're sorry. You need to say, I want to come home. I want to be with you, Lord. I want to be in. And then it happens. And that's the first step. So I just want to pray for you guys. And then I'm going to just bless you as if this is over and then you'll be dismissed. So, Lord, we just want to pause and say thank you for being the amazing God you are. 
And I pray, Lord, if there'd be anybody in this room who has either never crossed the line of faith or maybe they find themselves at a difficult point in life where they're questioning their faith, I pray that right now your spirit would come upon them and they would just realize the need and in their hearts they would make a decision for you. They would simply say they're sorry, they messed up for their sin, whatever they want to call it. They just say they're sorry and they ask you to be their Lord and Savior. I just pray if anybody would need to do that right now, hasn't done that yet. My prayer is that no one would leave here without a relationship with Jesus Christ so that they'd know that their eternity is secure with you. Lord, I pray your blessing upon this church. I pray for each person here. I pray you would bless and care for them. Your face would smile upon them, that they would realize how much you love them and how when you stretched out your arms on the cross, you did it just for each one of us that we might find our life in you. We might find that abundant life that you talk about, that fully satisfied life here that's just the entrance into heaven. May you bless them and keep them. Make your face smile upon them. In Jesus' name, amen.